For our time then this after or this morning, let us return to Second Corinthians. Second Corinthians chapter five. We have come to this point in our study of Second Corinthians. Very briefly, chapter 2 would remind us that the gospel is triumphant. Chapter 3 would remind us that the gospel is glorious, that it has more glory than the Old Testament law. And that's what chapter 3 would tell us, the glory of the gospel. Chapter 4 there that we looked at the last time that we looked at 2 Corinthians, it was talking about the glory of the gospel ministry. And the Apostle Paul was exulting in the fact that he was appointed an apostle and a preacher to the Gentiles and that it was given to him to preach Christ in all his fullness. Chapter 5 continues much in the same theme, but there is a slight difference in the sense that in this chapter here, he is highlighting reasons why he is highly motivated to serve the Lord Jesus Christ. And this is something that we want to consider this morning. Motivations for ministry is to be the title of our sermon. Motivations for ministry. There is nothing wrong in having ambition, provided you are ambitious for a good cause. There's nothing wrong, for instance, for a a young person to study, whether it be at school or further education, in order that they might get themselves an occupation that they want. For it's lawful for an individual to work and to earn. That is according to the Word of God. And therefore, for someone to be ambitious, to study, to pass their exams, and then maybe go to university and further study and pass their exams in order that they might be able to pursue the career of their choice, there is nothing wrong in that at all. And it would be a strange individual who wasn't motivated in order to do these things. And we would not confine motivation simply to getting a job or a or going to university. Motivation is what motivates people. Why do we come to the house of God? What motivates us to come to the house of God? If we struggle to come to the house of God, to worship Him on His day, then there's something wrong with our motivation. And you could go through various facets of life. The politician should be motivated to get to power in order that he might better the lives of individuals. We're not saying that is the case, but that's what should motivate a politician. He wants to be able to get into power in order that he might implement policies that he believes will bring about betterment in society. That, of course, is not often the case. Very often people are motivated in order to line their own pockets and they don't care about serving people at all. But we need to be motivated. There must be something that stirs us up to get out of bed in the morning and to be motivated for something. Now some people think that you you cannot be motivated to be a Christian. Well here the Apostle Paul is telling us clearly that He is motivated. He is highly motivated. And he's motivated for a good cause. And we are to commend him. And we are to replicate his motivation. And of course we have a better example than the Apostle Paul. We have the Lord Jesus Christ. Who was the one who was ultimately motivated. He was motivated to serve the living God. This was his meat and this was his drink in order to serve God. And we know in order to serve God, he had to suffer and he had to die. We could step back. He had to leave glory behind. He had to leave the realms of glory. He had to humble himself. He had to condescend. 
he had to become like us. Foxes have holes, and the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man had not where to lay his head. All of this was necessary in order for the Lord Jesus to accomplish and to purchase a salvation for his people. And he was motivated. He would not be distracted. Who, for the joy set before him, endured the cross. Well, the Apostle Paul was one who was highly motivated. And as we know, he was one who was a highly exercised Christian. And if your Christianity is somewhat lagging, and it's not what it should be, well, indeed, we can all put our hands up there and say it's not what it should be. But if you know that it could be better, maybe here's your problem. You don't have any motivation. You don't have any zeal. You don't have any enthusiasm. Well, the Apostle Paul, with all his difficulties, and he had difficulties, he was superabounding in motivation. And we want to look at some of these motivations as we find them in this chapter here. We have at least four motivations, whether we have time to go through and discover them all today is another matter. But in this chapter, there are at least four motivations that the Apostle Paul highlights. First of all, he has a future hope. A future hope. And this will be found in verses 1 to 8. What does verse 1 say to us? For we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God, and house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. What is he saying in this section? What's he talking about? Well, he's certainly talking about the great hope that lies before the Christian. There is no dispute about that. He is here marking out, for we know we have a great hope. But commentators are not agreed upon what that hope is. And basically there are two views. One view is saying that he's talking here about the resurrection body, about his glorified body. And the other view is that he's talking about heaven, about his eternal home. Now, when we consider he's talking about his great hope, whether you believe it's talking about the resurrection body or whether he's talking about heaven, in one sense, it doesn't make any difference. Because the resurrection body and heaven are both our great hope. So although there are differences of interpretation, there is really no difference in the final outcome. The final outcome is that the Christian has a wonderful, secure, final, great victory and hope. And that will ultimately be seen one day in his glorified body and in his eternal home in heaven. Now maybe you're asking, what does a minister think? Well, I can see two points of view. But if I'm going to lean upon any particular point of view, I do think here he is talking primarily about his resurrection body. Why? Well, the reason is that in the previous chapter that we looked upon, he's talking about his physical body. He's talking about his physical body. And what he's talking about in chapter 4 concerning his, his physical body is that his physical body is wearing out. He is devoting himself to the ministry of the Lord Jesus. And because of that, he is suffering in the body. He has been persecuted. He's been beaten. He's been mistreated. He's gone through all kinds of hardships 
which have taken his toll upon his body. But what he's saying here is in this great hope is that one day he's going to have a new body. He's going to have a spiritual body. He's going to have a glorified body. And here's the point. He's looking forward to that great hope when he's going to serve the Lord Jesus Christ with his new glorified body. And he's going to be just as motivated serving him in that new environment in heaven as he is serving him now with his somewhat decrepit and decaying and dying physical body. So you can see, although there are differences of interpretation, the real point is there. He has this great and glorious hope. He's going to be serving Christ and with the motivation he has now, it will be somewhat perfected. His motivation, great as it is now, will be nothing in comparison with the freedom and with the liberty that he's going to enjoy to serve the Lord Jesus Christ in perfect holiness, in perfect motivation. That's his great hope. That's his great future hope. And this great future hope stimulates him now. And the great hope that he has, friends, I'm happy to tell you that that's the great hope of every single Christian today. It's not a hope that has been confined to the Apostle Paul or to the Apostles or to the early Christians. No. It's yours. It's what Christ has secured for you. No matter how good your body is, no matter if it be in pristine condition, your present body is dying. It is decaying. And one day, one day it will all change. We know for the Apostle Paul and for many, many people, they died. They went through the death process. What's the death process? It's quite simply when the body and soul separate. The body returns to dust. The soul, the moment that the body dies, it returns to God. That's what's called the intermediate state when the soul is without a body. And he here talks about this state as being naked. That's what he means, being naked, when his soul is without a body, the intermediate state of the Christian. The moment the Christian dies, his soul goes to be with the Lord Jesus Christ, waiting for that day, when Christ shall return and the resurrection shall take place and he will have a glorified body, his soul shall be reunited with his resurrection body. But before that period, there is what is called the intermediate state, when the soul in some sense is naked. Now the day will come when Christ shall return. We don't know when that will be, but that day will come. And the Christians who are alive at that time will not undergo the normal death process. Their bodies shall be transformed in the twinkling of an eye. Mysterious, we don't know all of these things, but we are told that they shall not go through the death process. Instead, their body shall be changed from the physical to the spiritual, to the glorified body. That's the present hope of the Christian. Now, the Christian has this hope, and this hope should fire up the Christian to live for Christ today. We all need to be motivated. We all need goals. 
We all need things that stimulate us. And this is one thing that should stimulate us. One day we shall say goodbye to these bodies. And one day we shall have a body that is beyond our understanding. And we will, will be able to serve the Lord Jesus perfectly. Without sin, without decay, without aches, without pains, without anything that is normal to us today. We'll be able to serve him. Does this not stir us up then? Does it not cause us indeed to be full of zeal to serve the Lord Jesus Christ in our day and in our generation? What more motivation do we need to take up the cross and to follow him? This is what the Apostle Paul's telling us here. He is one who's highly motivated. And he's made such great progress in the Christian life because he is motivated, because he's sincere, and because he is zealous for the cause of Christ. And he's willing to be spent. He's willing to give up everything for him, who in turn has given up his life for him. Secondly, <coughs> we have another motivation from the Apostle Paul and it's we find this in verses 9 to 13 and we might sum up this motivation with by calling it a future judgment verse 9 wherefore we labor that whether present or absent we may be accepted of him for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that every one may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. Here is another stimulant towards motivation. What is it? Well, quite simply, the Apostle Paul, the great Apostle Paul, recognizes that he is accountable. And if you do anything at all, if you work for anyone, you are accountable. If you work for an employer, your employer wants to know what you're doing and how you're doing. It's the same for the Apostle Paul. He has been given this glorious commission to preach Christ. It was a tremendous commission. And he was one who took it very seriously. And all was in the back of his mind as he went about evangelizing and establishing churches. He recognized that in some sense he was an employee. And one day he would stand before King Jesus on his great white throne. And he would answer for his life. From the time that he got that commission, the Lord Jesus would have him answer. And this was something that also motivated him. There's going to be a day of accountability. And there's going to be a day of accountability to every single one of us. Here, let it be clear, let it be noted here, that here the, uh, the, the Word of God is primarily directed to the Corinthian Christians. It's to the Christians. And he's telling Christians that they're all going to appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Now we know today that in this world, people think it's ridiculous to think that God is going to judge mankind. Ridiculous. God going to judge mankind? God is a God of love. He's never going to judge mankind. Sadly, this kind of mentality has also come into the Christian church. And they think, there is no way are Christians going to be judged. Well, let us stay, state two things very, very clearly. Everyone shall be judged. Everyone that ever lived. Everyone, from Adam until the end of time, all who have lived will come forth out of their graves if they have died or if they are ones who are alive when the Christ returns, they too will be there and they will stand before 
Jesus Christ, all of us, everyone here, everyone listening, everyone outside, doesn't matter who they are, doesn't matter what they say, they'll not, they'll not have any choice in the matter, they will be summonsed, and they will not be able to resist, they will come, reluctantly maybe, but they will be there, you'll be there, I'll be there, without exception. And on that day, perfect justice shall be dispensed. But, and here's a very important but, and we want to stress this but, for the true-hearted Christian, he will be judged, she will be judged, but they will not be condemned. Now, it's important that we recognize the distinction. They will be judged, but not condemned. Why? Well, they cannot be condemned. I'm not simply talking here about professing Christians. No, no. Let's be clear. We're talking about real, genuine Christians. The ones who have the root of the matter in them. Not every professing Christian has the root of the matter in them. We have to discern. Thankfully, the minister cannot discern. Jesus Christ can discern. He's the judge. But every true hearted, genuine Christian, with their faults, with their feelings, will be judged. But they will never be condemned because Christ has been condemned in their place. And God is a righteous God. God is indeed a God of justice. And he will not condemn twice. If Christ has paid the price of your sins, they are paid. They are paid in full. And you... <coughs> Do not need to fear about being condemned on that day. But all others, if they do not have Christ as their Lord and Savior, they will be condemned. This motivates and stimulates the Apostle Paul. And we might say it does it in two ways. It does it in a personal sense. Oh, here he is. He has a message from heaven. He has the everlasting gospel. He's been given this task of opening his mouth and declaring Christ. And he has got this wonderful message from heaven. This life-transforming message from heaven. That if people will respond to this message favorably, they will be saved. And therefore he wants to be true to this message. And he wants to declare it wherever he will get an opportunity. Wherever people will gather. Whatever God in his providence will open up doors, he wants to be able to proclaim this message because he knows that only this message and only the Savior can save mankind. And this weighs upon him. And this motivates him. He recognizes without this message and without them embracing the Savior, they're finished. They're doomed. There's no hope. There's no other gospel. There's no other savior. There's no other message from heaven. God is not merciful to them outside of Christ. And therefore, he wants to declare it. He wants to be true to his commission. But also, he has this love towards his hearers. He sees the prostitute. He sees the drunkard. He sees the blasphemer. He sees the irreligious. He sees all kinds of people involved in all kinds of debauchery. And he sees mankind lost and fallen and perishing. And he sees them without hope in this world. And he tells them in the name of God be reconciled. This is what he is. Because he knows there's going to be that day of judgment. Now, as I said, this here is primarily written for Christians. And as one commentator said on this here, you know, the text tells us, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. There's a must, a must. You know, Christians, I'm not encouraging it, of course, but Christians may serve the Lord. But Christians must be judged. 
A Christian may not serve the Lord as he should. That's a possibility. But he must appear before Christ. This is what it says. For we must all appear. Every single one. Without exception. He puts himself here. For we must all appear. This is not nations being judged as nations. Because nations are judged in time. Our nation and the Western nations, in some sense, are under the judgment of God. How is that possible? What, what, what judgment has fallen upon us, you might say? Well, to put it very clearly and precisely and concisely, God is leaving us in our sin. He is punishing our sin by sin. Basically, the Western world has put its fist up to God and said, we don't want you. We don't want you in our churches even. We don't want you in our schools. We don't want you in our law courts. We don't want you in our parliaments. We don't want God at all. We don't want his, his word, his day, his people. We don't want you. And God has basically said to us at this particular time, you want your sin? You'll have your sin. And you'll have it until you're sick of it. I don't believe that time has come yet, to be quite honest with you. I believe we're still reveling and gloating in our sin. How long it will go on, who knows? Only the Lord knows. But I believe that's what's happening to us. He has, in some sense, withdrawn from us. Not, of, not entirely, of course, that would be impossible. But... You want your sin, you want your homosexuality, you can have it. And you'll see what destruction it will cause and havoc it will cause. You want to deny that there's simply male and female. You want to have other genders. You want to go against the word of God, the creator. You can have it. You'll see, you will see what happens. And we are seeing it. Maybe we'll see much, much more. Who knows? But God is judging nations. He does that in time. But what we're talking about here is individuals. All of us will stand before the Lord Jesus Christ. And for the Christian, when it says we must all be appear before the judgment seat of Christ, this is not to discover if we are saved. This is to discover our practice, not our position. We know on that great day, the people will come to realize that they are lost and they're perishing. But that's not why the Christian appears. He's not going to discover whether he's in Christ or out of Christ. He is going to discover his practice, that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done. It's our practice that shall be revealed. Whether we have served the Lord Jesus Christ or not. And there is a a theme here. The believer will appear. For we must all appear. Now that's not just simply talking about standing before Christ and being summonsed. Like we're summonsed to appear in court. It's more than that. When he's talking about appear. What he's talking about here is that everything shall come to light on that day. You will appear to be what you really are that day. That's what he's talking about. It's not just a summons. But everything will be clear. It will be manifest. The righteous will be exposed as righteous. Their faults 
will be also exposed. But they will be declared righteous. Their mistakes, their slips, their backslidings will all be revealed. It will be manifest. It will be clear. But they will not be condemned because ultimately they were righteous. But for hypocrites, that also will be revealed. And for the unbeliever, it will also be revealed. It will become clear and manifest to all. That's what's behind what he's saying there. And this will all happen, friends, when Christ returns. We want to ask ourselves then today, are we ready for that? This should motivate us. It should motivate the Christian. It should motivate us and spur us on that we would not be distracted, that we would not be sidetracked. We are to serve Christ. And we are to be highly motivated because that day will reveal everything. But of course, it's vitally important that we press this upon the conscience of the unbeliever. We know that Paul is speaking to believers here, but we are not distorting the Word of God when we also bring this to bear upon the unbeliever. Unbeliever! You will stand before the Lord Jesus. It's before the Bema seat. And every principal seat, uh, city in the Roman Emperor had this Bema place, this Bema seat, where the officials would sit and they would pronounce judgment. And this is what it's talking about here. The people of Corinth would have had a Bema seat. They would know exactly about it. They would know that the judges and the magistrates and those in a power and authority would go there and they would issue decrees from the Bema seat and the Lord Jesus will one day issue a judgment from his Bema seat and for the unbeliever it will be depart from me ye cursed. That's what he'll say. Now here the Apostle Paul is seeking to embrace people and to tell them to come to the Lord Jesus now before this terrible day comes. You can understand then how he was motivated, how he was stirred up, how he would go to all kinds of lengths in order that he might clearly proclaim the claims of Christ upon all, whether he was in chains before King Agrippa or whatever he was. He would lay the claims of Christ before them because that day is coming and the world may laugh and the church may dismiss it, but the, Lo but the Lord Jesus Christ will have his day with you. And there's no point in burying your head in the sand. No point. People say, I don't believe in God. I don't believe the Bible. I don't believe this. I don't believe that. One day all of these things shall be dispensed with. One day Christ shall have his day. And we are happy to tell you today is the day of grace. It is a day of grace. My time's almost gone. But he does finish with another motivation. <coughs> we'll briefly mention this other motivation. It is a pressing ministry. And we have it from verses 16 to verse 21. And basically here, what do we have? Verse 19 would sum it up. To wit, that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. The word of reconciliation... The Apostle Paul preached 
the full orbit or the full gamut of the gospel. He didn't miss anything out over his ministry. Obviously, he couldn't preach everything in a half an hour sermon or an hour sermon or a two hour sermon. But he did not dwell exclusively and entirely upon the judgment to come. It was part of his message, obviously. But he had more than that to say to people. It was appropriate to talk about judgment and to talk about the fact that people will perish if they're not in Christ that day. But he goes on to tell them, here's another motivation I have. I have the ministry of reconciliation. He's out to reconcile people to the gospel, to the Lord Jesus Christ. And here is something that must be impressed upon people from the pulpit. We are not hell, just hell, fire and brimstone. Far from it. We have something else to say. God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself. Here is a very profound statement. God was working in Christ. God was working a salvation in Christ. God was the one who took the initiative. God saw the problem. God dealt with it. A wonderful way to deal with it. He sent his son. Who would ever believe? Who would ever believe that God would send his son? And that he would have to undergo all that he did in order to save people. We could dwell upon this for hours, friends. But what we need to grasp here is that God was the one who undertook all this. And he undertook it in order that he would be able to be reconciled to mankind. And God is, in some sense, reconciled to mankind. And what the unbeliever has to acknowledge and perform is to be reconciled to God through accepting what he has done. The word of reconciliation. It's good news. Wonderful news. Glorious news. God has worked savingly, wonderfully on behalf of mankind. The word of reconciliation. Very often, we're characterized as people who preach nothing but hell. That's not the case. We preach the word of reconciliation. Peace. Peace with God. Peace that you're longing for. You might not admit it. Maybe you can't even explain it. But you're longing for this peace. You're trying to get peace by this way and that way. By your church attendance. Maybe by your givings. You'll do this and somehow God will be reconciled to you. Somehow you think you'll appease God. Well that won't happen. Never will. The only way to be reconciled to God is to embrace Christ. And to have him as Lord and Savior. To bow before him. We are ambassadors for Christ. Well, he was motivated, friends, because he had a glorious and wonderful future hope. Do you have that hope? He was motivated because there was a, fu a future judgment. He was going to give account of his work. So will you. And he was motivated because he had a pressing ministry. And that ministry was the only way that men and women could be saved. Motivation for ministry. May God bless his word to us. Let us pray together.